So good morning. I'm here with uh, supportive care counseling team at Hospice Peterborough with David Kennedy and Red Keating and I'm Julie Brown. And today we're just going to have a conversation about uh, the importance of ritual and also the loss of ritual that we've experienced during the pandemic. I think it's, uh, when you talk about ritual, I think um, it's one of those pieces that sometimes people have great a great deal of ritual in life that they don't even recognize as being ritual um, and so it's not a it's not a conscious decision I think there are other rituals that that we have that are very conscious and and regular and the pandemic has certainly prevented many of those ritual pieces especially when they include family and friends and gatherings and we could talk about funerals and those pieces of ritual that we take for granted um, that suddenly we can't participate in. And I think that's a huge piece that we haven't really faced and talked about. Why do we think they're so important? What is it that they do for us? Well, they prescribe, right? They give us a sense of, of what to do in certain situations. What makes sense? Because you, know, you can have a cultural ritual, you can have a family ritual, um, and you may not even understand that it's a ritual. But if everybody, I think, looks at Christmas, even what your family does at Christmas might be different than what my family does at Christmas, and I think that's the Christmas ritual. Um, so that I think they prescribe for us and give us a sense of what to do in certain circumstances, and they they teach us sort of the meanings around whatever the event is. Um, so they can ground that and, and why are we doing this? Yeah. David, why do you think they're so important? I think that's uh, what you said, Red, is really, it, it gives us a grounding in some cases, for instance, when you're talking about the, the, the rituals around holiday, I think <clears throat> those, are, those are rituals that ground us in our history and our, in who we are and where we belong. So there can be a belonging history uh, and ritual to those pieces. Um, so I think that's why a lot of people find them important, which is also why a lot of times the breaking of those rituals can be a very meaningful thing too, because they can also speak to where we are going, not just where we have come from. And I think, again, I think rituals can, <clears throat> can represent a number of things, and if we are consciously making that ritual uh, have a meaning, I think it can really, really help us move in wherever we need to be going. Um, so sometimes rituals are transitional in saying, this is who I used to be, but this is who I am now. And that's where I think in grief, uh, particularly that ritual of transition, at some point, now there's no, there's no perfect time for that some people some people it takes a long time to get to that place where they're willing and able to do that ritualistic transition <clears throat> and again for some people it's unconsciously done um, but I think there can be some great work and advantage to having a ritual that that is that is has that purpose to help us anchor us in terms of okay I can't go back to what it was, but this is representative of where I'm going to be going. So it's that, as you use the word transition, mm -hmm. yeah, that there's an ending, and there's a, also I'm moving into some new right. beginnings. One of the things I, I think about with ritual in relation to loss and grief is that um, it makes us pause. It makes us pause in the everyday routines of our life and say, this is important. What's happened is significant. So if we're talking about the death of someone, that this death is significant. Their life is significant. The people who are mourning their loss, this is significant. And I'm going to take time out of my regular schedule. And I'm going to show up in whatever form that looks like. And we're going to acknowledge it. And we're going to come together and have connection around that and that's something that um, the pandemic is really interfering with is our ability to 
be together to witness each other's grief to witness the the death of this person to not be able to acknowledge and celebrate their life but also acknowledge that they are no longer here that they have died and i just think that is uh, another loss among losses that this pandemic has brought right so i've lost someone they've died it's the pandemic and now my ability to even acknowledge that loss within my my group of people has also been lost and and, and i think um to some degree, I think too, the pandemic has given, has pushed this, which something that has started even before that. And again, <clears throat> I think the loss of that ritual, and, and, and you just triggered something with me there, Julie, around, um, even around, so we talk about um, the funerals. When I, when I was growing up, um, you know, somebody died it was pretty ritualistic, you know, at three days, usually three days later was the funeral, you right? You could count on it, your calendar you count when on your the calendar. visitation and the funeral um, was going to happen. But it was, a, <laughs> it, was an, it was an inconvenience to life. And, and I think it was, I think what you just said there was so important because the ritual can speak to the meaning of that person. Let's stay with the grief. That, that when we do these things, we are honoring them and we're honoring who they are in li- in our life. So that's why family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, anybody connected has a sense of I need to ha- participate in this to honor this relationship. But I saw this trend happening much before COVID, but I think what COVID has done is given people permission or an excuse. Um, but I, I, I do value the rituals around death. And one of them is that it is inconvenient because death, death is the one thing that we don't control that way. Well, we're, we're, we're starting to try to. With, <laughs> but the reality is death interrupts life. Mm-hmm. And I think that rituals that can recognize the interruption of life by death are, are some of the most powerful rituals. I got so much going through my head. I think one of the things that, uh, several ideas here, and one is transition and evolution. Um, but rituals, if, if, if life is a sentence, rituals are the punctuation. They're the periods, the exclamation marks, the, at the end of a sentence, um, because they mark a moment in time. Um, and then if there's another sentence, then of course there's the future, there's the next step. But what the pandemic has done, is, especially around the grief rituals, is that one of the most important part of a grief ritual is the coming together. And it has really impacted our ability to be together, to hug, to cry, to hold hands, um, and to just be witnesses with each other in that moment of sadness. Um, and it has challenged us because I think it's in the, you know, that's one of our main parts in a funeral ritual but so much of our funeral rituals have been handed over to funeral directors and funeral home staff and clergy that it's almost something that we can go through in a fog. And, and that's, that's not a bad thing because it's not a great time for us to be able to be thinking clearly. And now we're sort of left to our own devices because some of those things aren't available to us anymore. And so what we would rely upon in order to maintain the structure of our regular funeral r- rituals aren't necessarily um, availed to us in the same way. And so it seems to have put a lot more responsibility on the individuals to figure out how they're going to get through this, which was a step that we didn't normally have to think of. Two to four, seven to nine, two days, third day funeral and burial. That was it. And now it's so different and so much of the responsibility to create our own. And we do that. We, we do create our own rituals because rituals aren't set in stone. They do evolve over time and they do change. It's this one came down so fast. And on top of it, you've got the worry of you know, safety of everybody there that might be coming to a funeral or the safety of other people in society. So I think that really that coming together um, is what we did as part of the ritual. And then there were so many other factors that controlled the process or the structure of the ritual. And that's gone. One of the things, and I'm hoping we'll talk in a few moments about how we're getting creative with that. But something that I'm starting to hear a trend of is people postponing, you know, until 
you know, later, like hoping, you know, we keep hoping this pandemic is going to have some end. And so what I'm hearing is when there's been a death, somebody's, you know, people, family saying, well, we'll do that when, we'll do a celebration of life when. And now recently I've heard <clears throat> of a couple families who say, well, it's been so long, I don't know if we will. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm worried about that. And I don't know if mm -hmm. you guys feel that way. I'm thinking about, you know, we've heard the term COVID long haulers for people who have, are really suffering with this virus. But I just, I'm starting to worry that we're going to have this COVID long haulers, you know, kind of in relation to grief as well. Um, and, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, that the ritual is, is, is everything in terms of our journey of grief, but it is an important part. And I, I am concerned about, you know, that this, be, because we kind of keep kicking the can further down the road around that, sorry to use that kind of crass term, but I am worried about then when are we going to market? When are we going to come together? When is it going to be acknowledged? And I, and I think that's a, a legitimate worry, to be honest with you, because I do too, Julie. Not only do I worry that people will say, as you've uh, acknowledged, that, well, it's been so long now, we won't bother. But it's, it's this sense that we lose the moment. We, we, when we postpone some, a death for nine, ten months, a year, when we do gather, we, we've lost that sense of this person has died and, 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 and the meaning of that in that moment. Mm. So what it often becomes, and this is where I, where I acknowledge or where I was going before when I said I think there was this trend which is really, in my mind, tied to our whole avoidance of death, um, that, that, that we have this celebration of life, that we focus on on everything except the death, right? So if, if we're having that trouble now, the pandemic has pushed these celebrations. And, and I, I fear that what, what it will become um, is, will miss the real sense of death as being part of this mm. experience. And I know people don't like that. They, they don't wanna cry. They don't wanna feel sad. They don't. But that's what death does to us. Mm -hmm. And if we never have a sense to collectively share that, then I think we lose that, that something mm -hmm. significant in that. I'm nodding my head a lot to what you're saying, mm -hmm. David. Um, so you're saying you were already seeing this trend and was part of what was pushing this trend even prior to the pandemic was, you know, we don't like to feel our feelings. Right. We don't when we come together and it's still fresh and raw, well, right. we might be messy. Right. You know, why we might be emotionally and it's, it's vulnerable. It's exposing. Yeah. It's, and, and then we're doing it in front of people. Right. 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 And so we push it out and then maybe I can be contained, but you're saying this is just part of what it means to yeah. live and die. Right. It's part of life. Well, it changes the purpose of the ritual possibly, because I think the purpose of the more immediate funeral rituals that we're used to is that it helps us move through a process of shock, disbelief, while surrounded by the love and shock and disbelief of everybody else. Yep. And so there's a collective sense that we're all in this together. Yep. When we do it a year later, we're not doing it from a place of, I need to get over it, potentially, maybe some, maybe some for some, that sense of shock and disbelief. I've lived a year without that person. I, I, have a, I have an experience of being in the world without that person. So now I'm coming together, and what's the purpose? Is the purpose to try to relive what we didn't get to do a year ago? Or do we have to define this as a new ritual in a new situation, um, in a new time? And that, that, that maybe is only for this period of time. Maybe when this is all over and, and, and we can get back to <laughs> somewhat normal life again, we'll go back to our traditional uh, uh, rituals. But right now is the challenge for us to take that year later, that eight months later, and kind of go, this isn't a funeral ritual anymore. This is something different. Right. That's a good way of thinking um, about it, Rad. Because I, I do, uh, the, the, where I worry, and I come back is that, um, I, I, again, I, I don't want to belabor this, but these are trends that I have witnessed and what the pandemic has done is given a voice to some of these things. So um, where I hear 
that before. Is people, well, it's interesting. People will say things like, um, "Oh, I'm." When I ask them about, you know, what what what's what are your plans? What are your family plans for after? Oh, we're just. I'm just going to get cremated, or just cremate me. And just is a, <laughs> just is a word of convenience, right? It's like, just is well, just whatever is simple, whatever is quick, whatever is convenient. And I think that there's already been this push. The other thing I have heard over the last few years is we're, gonna, we're not gonna do anything right now. We're gonna wait until the summer when we can have everybody, when it's convenient for everybody to get together. So there's already this push for convenience, which, which is more important. So, so the living is more important than the dead. Whereas funerals, the dead was more important than the living, mm -hmm. um, in some sense, you know. But I, 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 I know that yep. needs to be fleshed out. But but that's that's where some of what I was seeing starting in trends. Now the pandemic has given people permission and an opportunity, and I hope it's elastic. I hope we do go back. I hope people do say, you know what, I know we need to do this differently. And I'm not saying we go back to traditional funeral. I don't think that's, you know, I'm not talking about that. But we need to find ritual around that death that's meaningful at that time. Um, so, but I, that, that, was a, that was a good comment. What are some ways that through your work here at hospice with families that you, heard, that you have heard of people being maybe creative to still create ritual and honor ritual and honor the death. Yeah, I think, one, and, and one of the things that I've discovered, Julie, is that as people become less connected to traditional religious um, traditions, that, that they don't have those connector pieces when death happens, and so they're not, they, a, they don't feel comfortable going back and just participating. So they, they're they forced to find new rituals. And, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a healthy thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I think what I have observed and, and I've participated in here at hospice are ways in which families can um, creatively allow and gather the people that need to be gathered without necessarily the, the, the structural pieces of church, etc. So, you know, we've done this, I've done this um, um, Jackson's Creek <laughs> with, a, with family gatherings at a, very, at a spot that was meaningful for them. Um, the, the involvement of kids in it, we've done some, I've done some work with, with instead of, you know, keeping children out of these rituals, of finding ways to include children in these rituals, um, which I find really, really helpful and good and meaningful. So I think there's lots of ways to do it, um, but it, it, it's an opportunity, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I've, I've heard from a few different people that our ritual of the honor guard for people that take advantage of it, for some, that's all they get. You know? Right. Do you want to maybe just explain what that is here um, at hospice? Sure, sure. Um, when when someone dies, uh, the family is offered um, the opportunity to participate in an honor guard, where um, uh, staff uh, at hospice stop working. Um, some folks come that are related to the family or friends. Uh, at this point, they stay outside. Um, and when the funeral home comes and the body was prepared to be taken from, uh, from hospice, there is um, the ceremonial sort of walking out of the body uh, with staff and friends and family um, out to the street where the body is then loaded into the car uh, and the funeral home takes that person away. Um, and then, uh, so there's a sort of an outside um, moment in which people that are present have that opportunity to sort of say goodbye. Um, and so I, I've heard from a few different people how because there was going to be no other ritual, that the significance that that then represented for them was, was you know, very appreciated. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, 
I'm hearing a lot of everything's on hold, mm -hmm. everything's on hold until another time. It's quite interesting the impact of this on the whole funeral profession. Um, it's funny, I did a webinar for BC funeral directors last week, and one of the things that came out of that was their sense that everything they've been trained to do, now they can't do. So, and what they are asked to do now is much more of an enforcement policeman, and, and which goes against everything that they've mm. been trained to do. Mm. So they are in this dissonance of, you know, I know, what I, I know what I'm trained to do around death, but I can't do it. And, and what I'm asked to do is not what I was trained to do. It goes against that. So you have the, even in the, in, 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 in the profession itself, you have this incredible dissonance. But I think I, I really picked up on something you said earlier, Red, about that this is forcing people maybe to make, to take back a little bit more control of the ritualistic pieces as opposed to what we have always done is just hand it over. Now, always done the last 50 years, 60 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, we've handed it over to a profession. Um, whereas now we're maybe taking more responsibility. Um, and, and I know the, f the funeral profession is trying to find its place in this new, this new way of being too, because it has to find a way to, 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 to adjust. So there's a lot of adjustments around these rituals that we take, but I, I hope that we just don't give up on rituals. I think that's kind of the key takeaway here, isn't it? That it looks different, it has to look different, but that doesn't mean that we don't do it. Right? and that we can get creative. I'm certainly hearing you know, a story about people who gathered around a bonfire outside and worked that into the ritual, and that was, it was a significance, the, the location of the bonfire to the person who had died. And other ways, um, a person told me about, you know, they could only gather a few people at graveside for the funeral, but at the same, simultaneously, while they were doing that, a friend had organized a prayer group online to be praying for the family at the same time. And that has brought immense comfort to know that their community gathered for them at that same time that they were ho holding the graveside mm -hmm. funeral. And that has come up many times as we've talked about that. That's one interesting story, I think. I'm I think I can tell this one. I'll, I'll, I'll mask it enough that it won't be. <laughs> but my brother is a, is a, a celebrant for, uh, for funerals. And uh, he was telling me of one where a gentleman had died and had no family. He was, he was quite aged. And um, he, he only had a cousin and a, uh, no, two cousins, I guess it was, down in East Coast in the Maritimes. And he hadn't seen them, I don't know, for years and years and years and years, like, but there was absolutely no family. But he had prepaid his funeral, and he, and in the prepaying of the funeral was a funeral service, and and so my brother did the service, and they they live streamed it <laughs> to two people in Nova Scotia, but my brother said there was nobody in the chapel, right? So he's he's trying to do this funeral. How do you do a, a, a service with with nobody there knowing it was being? But but for that gentleman, what was interesting to me was that. That ritual was such, he felt that. Now, on one part, you could argue why do a ritual that has nothing to do with you, you're dead, right? But maybe maybe he saw something in that that was meaningful to, to, to make that happen. And that was meaningful to him in his dying process, right, in his right. dying yeah. journey, was yeah. to know that that was something that was important. Yeah. So one of the things you said there, kind of both of you, um, <clears throat> that struck me was that sense of it, there was not a large family. Well, what happens when there is a large family, right? And then so much of, of, of the restrictions, you were talking about the restrictions, so they did the prayer group online. Um, the restrictions really have made um, more, more widespread a sense of being disenfranchised from your grief because you're not able to visit the person. You're not going to a funeral. And so how do you grieve that which you've never truly experienced in, in, mm -hmm. in a way? Um, and I think that potentially makes ritual that much more important uh, because maybe you haven't been able to be a part of the process of, of being with the person, supporting the person prior to their death. Mm -hmm. Then how do you then 
experience the loss of that when you have been maybe um, through the, 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 the restrictions from the pandemic been sort of put on the sideline. Um, so I, there's the potential there that the ritual becomes even more important mm-hmm. um, to realize for people their grief. It's, it's, it surprises me. I, I must admit, I, I am always surprised um, at the impact and the power of ritual um, around, for instance, our hospice walk. So when we do the hospice walk, we begin with a circle, uh, a ritual circle. And it's, I do a ceremony of uh, ritual around grief and, and um, strength, and we use stones. And it's amazing to me how people will come to me and say, you know, we look forward to this every year because the ritual anchors us. It gives us an excuse excuse it gives us a reason to do this to to remember to to stop and pause and and remind ourselves of that person and grief and it's okay and and we can cry you know even five years i mean we we have people coming to the hospice hike who you know who are coming in memory of people from 10 years 12 years ago but they say every year it's so important to have that ritual that gives me an, a, an, an opportunity again to revisit. So it's, maybe it's not just the ritual at the death, but it's, it's how do we do it? Not everybody needs that or wants that, but, but often it can be an opportunity uh, for people to find that moment, that chance to, to do what's, what's important, right? Just reminds me of that you know, you know, David Kessler, who writes about death and grief, says, you know, we have grief needs to be witnessed. It has to right? be witnessed. And that opportunity yeah. that when you yeah. form that circle, it's like we're witnessing yeah. our yeah. our grieving journey twelve years later. Yeah. If if that and but that is part of what ritual does. Right. Right? Is it witnesses our it witnesses the death, the loss, the grief that accompanies that. Sometimes I've used ritual when I'm working with somebody in grief around, again, we talk about purposes of ritual. So sometimes we can use ritual for a reconciliation. Mm-hmm. So when there's been a, a you know, a, a particular tumultuous relationship where a lot of hurt has happened um, and the person has died, and, and often I will hear like, well, there's nothing we can do about it, the person's dead. <clears throat> and I said, well, there, there's lots we can do about it because you're carrying it, right? Um, reconciliation uh, is is after death is is about how do you reconcile what you're experiencing the confliction in yourself and I have found that ritual can be a very powerful way to deal with and and we it takes some work to talk about forgiveness and and what that means but but I like the term reconciliation that allows us to reconcile what has happened in the story with that individual or that those people and myself to to where I can live now in a in a state that's not perpetual anger guilt whatever it is that's left there and I have I have found that ritual can be a really helpful and meaningful way for people to deal with those issues after death um, and, and I think art is really important to do that. So, so again, sometimes rituals can be that. Uh, uh, sometimes rituals uh, are about gratitude. Um, and that's, you know, can we, as we move through this grief, maybe two years, three years, four years, maybe the, the focus of that ritual when we come together on that day is one of gratitude. Mm-hmm. Can, can we find a focus of gratitude in this ritual? Um, so I think, again, rituals can be a lo- mean a lot of different things. So I think different it's purposes. Wor- it's, worth, it's worth spending time thinking about. And so I think as we wrap up our conversation today, um, just want to check in with you guys. Anything else that you want to, to add or you know, lead people to think about? David, I'm hearing you say, like, take the time. Take the time. It's important. 
to determine what you need and hmm. how we can get creative and give that space yep. for ritual. I think it's important for us to identify it as a ritual. I, I'm not sure if we haven't moved away as a general culture, away from the concept or the idea of ritual. Special moments in the life of a person become a party. Graduation it is a party. Even though there's a ritual ceremony to a graduation, it, it, you know, you, you think about that we used to have rituals when, when we, one day you were a child and the next day you were an adult. You know, there was something happened. Um, and, and I don't know if we see our celebrations in the same sort of context as this is a ritual. Um, and we are a ritual people. But have we just become a party people? Um, and and the, every party has to be bigger and better than the next versus, and maybe some, I, I'm, I'm not going to be totally wrong in that, but somehow that we've lost the meaning of ritual potentially along the way. So when we talk about it, it can kind of sound kind of foreign or kind of strange to our ear to talk about ritual as a thing because our culture really doesn't focus on ritual, uh, maybe the way it used to or the, may, the way other cultures do. So I would say that. It would be neat to sort of uh, get that, maybe that thinking more clearly or more uh, front and center in, in the cultural mind that we've got. No, and I, I would agree with you, Red. I think, uh, and I look at other cultures where ritual is a very intricate part of living. And I, I there, there's times, you know, when I, when I envy that, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. Uh, and I think about the traditions and the cultures around or the, tr the, the rituals around death in, in our First Nations traditions, cultures. Jewish. Uh, Jewish has mm -hmm. some phenomenal mm -hmm. traditions, rituals. But I think, again, I would really hope we can uh, find those. It, it, it's funny, I was just sitting here thinking, as a child growing up, of all the rituals that, that were there spoken in, whether it was something conscious or unconscious, I think most of them included food. <laughs> the, and did, food is yep. such an important it piece of, of the gathering, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's funny how those memories are part of the ritualistic and that, oh, that community of eating and drinking together mm -hmm. uh, are part of this piece too. So, yeah. Well, I think we'll um, bring that to a close. Um, we've been sitting here in hospice having our little coffee morning chat. And some of the sounds you can hear is it's there's a thunderstorm moving through Peterborough, so if you can hear that, and there's just life in hospice here behind us. But um, this has been really meaningful. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Red.